This is a Major League Baseball magazine special presentation. Baseball Magazine. This week's cover story, 1975, and a pair of rookies who took Boston by storm. Our styles mixed together very well, and we knew each other, and that helps a lot. We'll travel to the minor leagues where a pitcher finally makes the big time by keeping his mouth open. I thought I could go out and have a great year in baseball and That'll possibly be my chance to be on ESPN, but here I am on ESPN saying Smitty as And we'll go around the league where three Tommy John errors on one play is a little hard to swallow. Yeah, I should have just eaten the ball. That's it, just, just eat it. This is Warner Fusell. In 1975, Frank Robinson becomes baseball's first black manager. Nolan Ryan throws the fourth no-hitter of his career, while Catfish Hunter becomes one of the first big-time free agents. And fresh from Pawtucket in 1975, two rookies earn roster spots on the Boston Red Sox. Fred Lynn and Jim Rice, destined to become one of the most exciting rookie tandems in baseball history. They were a tremendous talent. It didn't take many uh, days on the ball field in spring training of 75 to know that they were going to fit exactly and do what we all needed and wanted them to do. We came on the scene and the ball club wasn't doing that well until we got there and, and uh, we did help turn it around, although there was a lot of other talent besides Jimmy and I. These two guys played like they'd been around the league for a while. They didn't make rookie mistakes. Uh, a couple, but, but nothing that would stand out that ruin a, a ball game, lose a ball game for you. These guys were, these guys were winners. They won games for us. Watching uh, Lynn play that year was really a lot of fun because uh, when we needed a big hit or a home run, he came through it. And the same thing with Jimmy. They called them the Gold Dust Twins, and they definitely were to us. They meant a lot to us. Fred Lynn and Jim Rice helped resurrect baseball in Boston. But there was such a good story, the entire nation wanted to share in the enthusiasm they brought to the game in 1975. Lynn hit 331 that year and led the league with 47 doubles and 103 runs scored. Rice hit 309 with 22 home runs and more than 100 RBIs. They complemented established stars like Carl Yastrzemski and Luis Tiant and helped put Boston in the World Series. One manager, Darrell Evans, entered without Rice, whose wrist was broken by a Vern Rule pitch the final week. I don't think he was throwing at me. It was just one of those accidents, one of those things that was going to happen in baseball. And there was nothing that I can do with her. I think everyone wants to to play in the World Series. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to play in the, my first year in the big leagues in the World Series. I really felt for Jimmy because to work that hard and, and to finally get to a series and then not to get to participate uh, must have been a real blow. So with Rice on the side, the Red Sox took on the big red machine of Cincinnati. Joe Morgan, Johnny Bench, and Pete Rose. It was a series that took on epic proportions as it progressed. 
With the Red Sox trailing three games to two, the series moved back to Boston, where a relentless rain made tension a formality. Finally, after three days, the players assembled for game six, and it was rookie Fred Lynn who bolstered Boston's hopes with a three-run homer in the first inning. But even with Tiant on the mound, the big red machine came roaring back and led six to three in the eighth after a leadoff homer by Cesar Geronimo. Boston appeared dead, and then Bernie Carbo. Incredibly, the score was tied at six. Then in the bottom of the 12th, Boston's Carlton Fisk painted an image that would live forever in baseball memory. The 1-0 delivery to Fisk. He swings, long drive, left field. If it stays there, it's gone. Home run! The Red Sox win! And the series is tied three games apiece. The sheer drama of the game helped bring 70 million viewers to their sets for Game 7, which Cincinnati won for its first of two straight World Championships. But in retrospect, it was the sixth game that stood alone as one of the most remarkable ever played. I'll never forget going uh, to the bus that night. Uh, Rose came up and tapped me on the shoulder. I was walking up. He said, wasn't that the greatest game you have ever been in. I told him, Peter Edward, you are crazy. I said, that game there, you call the greatest game we've lost. And I said, I'm not going to sleep tonight. And you say, that's the greatest game. He said, look, we'll win tomorrow. But that was the best game I've ever played in. I think it came at a good time because baseball at that time was a little bit down and it needed something, it needed a little spark. And uh, that series gave it the spark. And ever since then, uh, every year has been a new attendance record set and uh, more people come out to see baseball than ever before. And I think that series uh, helped a great deal. Lost in the hoopla were the fine seasons of Jim Rice and the only man ever to win the MVP and Rookie of the Year awards the same season Fred Lynn. I didn't really get a chance to enjoy it as much as I should have or could have because everything happened too quickly. Um, when the awards started coming, um, I just said, well, you know, thanks a lot. And, and they were, I just kind of looked at them. And, and they don't really mean that much to you when you get them. It's, it kind of takes a while. When you put everything away, you go back, not necessarily look at your golden gloves, the other awards are are good, but by winning uh, eight Golden Gloves or MVP or Rookie of the Year doesn't mean you'll be in the Hall of Fame. The two rookie sensations of 1975 went on to have outstanding careers. But ironically, today it is Rice and not the heavily honored Lynn whose numbers have him knocking on the Hall of Fame door. A lifetime 300 hitter, Rice led the league in homers three times, twice in RBIs. Despite his recent problems in Boston, Jim has given the city a long and productive career. It's been a different story for Lynn, who was traded to California in 1981 and is now with Baltimore. Haunted by nagging injuries, Fred never lived up to the potential he displayed in 1975. I think when Fred left this ballpark, it hurt him. Because uh, he had such tremendous power to left field in this park. This park was built for him. When I got to Fenway, I learned how to hit the ball the other way, and I could do it very effectively. It took me a couple of years to adjust to not playing there. And my average has never been as good as it was at, as it was when I played with the Red Sox. I won eight gold gloves, and I've always said I've always had a great center fielder next to me. And that's what makes the side field is so good as a great center fielder. And Freddie was that to me. He really complimented me as an outfielder, so I hated to see him go. Our styles mixed together very well, and we knew each other, and that helps a lot. I felt that uh, we had we would have had a good career together here playing at Fenway Park, and I didn't want him to go because he knew how I, how I was going to play, different reactions as far as playing left field, as far as playing together because we played all through the minor leagues together. It would be nice to go out 
and sit around and, and shoot the bull for a while. It would be fun. Um, although you start to to uh, digress a little bit and you start to say, geez, it wouldn't be nice if we could all get together again and do it, but it doesn't look like that's ever going to happen. But uh, it was nice while, while we were there, while it lasted. Hi, I'm Rusty Staub, and you're watching Classic Sports Network. What goes on inside the brain of a pitcher like John Smoltz? How does he tune out 50,000 screaming fanatics? How does he stay focused with a runner on first who does the 40 and 4-4 four four and a 342 hitter at the plate? You see, all Smoltz thinks about is this imaginary tunnel with a two-inch leather target at the end. And there's only one sound that can break his concentration. Strike three! One of baseball's latest heroes both on and off the field. Setting the Ironman record of most consecutive games played, Cal Ripken Jr. has shown why he's destined for baseball's Hall of Fame. Now you can share a piece of this legend with the Ironman Collector Watch. This elegantly styled stainless steel watch is a unique limited edition collectible. This fashionable watch has an attractive micron plated brass plate for the hour dial. With the date Cal Ripken Jr. broke Lou Gehrig's record and the watch's collector number on the back. It all comes inside this unique leather-like baseball case and includes a matching certificate of authenticity. This valuable collectible will be sold during this TV introductory offer for only $69.95 on a first-come, first-served basis. To order your Cal Ripken watch for three payments of $24.63, call 1-800-793-7025. Or send check and money order for $69.95 plus $3.95 shipping to Cal Ripken watch. PO Box 78, Grand Central Station, New York, New York. Or call 1-800-793-7025. To study years gone by, you could watch Truman's surprise win over Dewey in 1948. Or check out the surprise win of the Miracle Mets in the 1969 World Series. You could study Nixon's near-perfect sweep in the 1972 election. Or watch total perfection as the 72 Dolphins become the NFL's only undefeated team. If you see history a little differently, watch the classic years in sports, Sunday and Thursday at 7, only on Classic Sports Network. It's Broadway Joe at the top of his game. You make a pass and it hits all over. The baby pass now and it's The Joe Namath Show, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. Tune in and turn on, only on Classic Sports. In the news, Tommy John becomes the first pitcher in 90 years to make three errors in one inning. And all three were on the same play. They'll only be able to get one if they can get that here. John bobbles the ball and to the helmet. John does not normally make that kind of mistake. They're going to try to score again there. And Tommy, oh, oh, oh. Oh, Tommy John God. should have stayed out of the way both times, but he's in there and they'll go on and he will. Let's see, they're going to let him score. Yep. Tommy made two errors. Tommy should have stayed right on the mound. <laughs> well, you're right, absolutely. Three errors? They can't give him three errors now. I should have just eaten the ball. That's it, just, just eat it. But uh, I saw him still down the line, and I said, well, you know, if I make a good throw, I can get him. And then I threw it to the bat boy, and he got out of the way. And then, um, then when I threw the other one, it was the same thing. I just threw it, and I was throwing it to, to, to their trainer. And uh, like I said, with the th thunderstorm coming through, there was a lot of negative ions in the air. And, and I think right in that area, I, I, I must have had a metal cup on or something because they, it vibrated and it just glitched in my head. Uh, and that's all I can say. From ions to nylons, the kind you wear on your feet as in Terry Pendleton's bid to become a modern-day Joe Jackson. Dropping in. McGee will score 4-1 Cardinals. Losing his shoe, Terry Pendleton will go into third base. For the shot first slide. And Terry Pendleton's shoe back at second base. It is a triple for Pendleton. The Cardinals lead 4-1. That's got to be a strange feeling. All of a sudden, you got no shoe left. Not as strange as watching Mike Lavalier steal his first base since a day in the minors in 1983. Well, they run Lavalier. The throw to second. Not in time. They drop the ball. Spanky's at second base. 
Spanky has stolen base number one. If they give it to him, I don't... It was on the board okay, as a stolen well, base. Okay, well, that's his first career stolen base, John. Oh, we'll have to toast him after this game. Kansas City's George Brett recently hit two home runs against the Yankees, the second of which won the game. Brett has hit 31 dingers against New York in his career, but to Yankee fans, it seems like a hundred. Remember the 1978 playoffs against Catfish Hunter? Well, the Hunter became the hunted as Brett took the Catfish into deep water with three consecutive home runs. George Brett hits it to right field. Is it three in a row? Yes! Ha, ha, ha! Incredible! What a performance! And, of course, there were the 1980 playoffs. And once again, the Yankees' goose was cooked by Brett. Set by Gossage. A high drive hit deep to right field. It is gone! Three-run home run by George Brett into the third tier of Yankee Stadium. And Brett has taken the Royals and put them in front. But Brett's most famous home run against the Yankees was a somewhat more sticky situation. It was two men out in the top of the ninth in one of them classic settings. The goose on the mound in that big apple town and George is up there batting. As the crowd chants goose, he turns it loose with fire and smoke and ash. George spins it deep in the right field seat, another timely crash. As he rounded third and he hit it on home was a gleam in Billy's eye. Dick wondered, what's he up to now? I know this guy's real sly. Billy grabbed the bat as both teams sat in awe upon their benches. Says, there you are, that there's pine tar, and it's a whole lot more than 18 inches. Now, the game they played that summer day won't be famous for the scores, but the incidents that have happened since will be remembered as Tar Wars. You're watching Classic Sports Network, where the legends play. We were more or less more interested, I believe, the players on our club in keeping the streak alive than Lou was. And I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to live for. I saw that day if you talk about sadness in any case, that's the day I saw photographers cry. We're all out there on the field and the fans, oh, an ovation like I've never heard in my life before or since. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life, believe me. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Hi, Bob Vila here to show you a unique new Craftsman tool no home should be without. Craftsman Handicut Utility Cutters, the one tool you can count on for all kinds of tough cutting jobs. Craftsman Handicut does the job of utility knives, carpet knives, shears, shop cutters, and more. Look how tough it is to make a good cut through this damaged garden hose with a utility knife. Craftsman Handicut gets it done in one clean cut. It's a terrific small branch and shrub pruner. Shears or shop cutters can't trim vinyl flooring as easily as the Craftsman Handy Cut. Use the Craftsman Handy Cut to cut nearly any common household material, including rope, plastic, leather, vinyl, and rubber. Call now, and you can order your Craftsman Handy Cut for only $19.99. And remember, when you buy from Sears, your satisfaction is guaranteed or your money back. To order your Craftsman Handy Cut, get your Sears card or their credit card ready and call 1-800-203-9944. That's 1-800-203-9944. Call right now. They were one of the greatest teams in football history, a dynasty lasting nine seasons. Who is this legendary powerhouse? Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. Every Wednesday night, review a classic week of games from the 1960s and 70s as Pat and Tom profile the toughest matchups and key players. Plus, we'll be showing you all the best pro football action. 
Ah! I'll say no more. Watch this week in pro football, Wednesday at 10, only on Classic Sports. Spawn insane, and then you better pray for rain. It's one of those baseball axioms born in the newspaper that has stood the test of time. And for good reason. For beginning on Labor Day in 1948, Warren Spahn and Johnny Sane started 11 of 16 games for the Boston Braves. Sane won five, Spahn captured four, and the Braves, well, they won the pennant. In 48, our schedule was such in New England that we had a lot of schedule off days because of the weather. And it just so happened that Vern Bickford came up with a bad arm so that we had a schedule off day and then it would rain so that John would pitch, I would pitch, John would come back, I would come out. And I think for about six or seven starts, that's what it was. And we got hot and we won the pennant. And uh, one of the newspaper men, I don't remember his name, coined the phrase, Spawn saying and pray for rain. And it's probably the greatest publicity that John and I ever had. But it was unfair to Nelson Potter and Bobby Hogue and Bird Bickford that had good years that year. During those days, they drew a lot of cartoons in the papers, and they drew a cartoon of uh, me camped on the mound with a teepee and a campfire and all. But uh, Spawn would pitch, and I would pitch, and it would rain, and he would pitch, and I would pitch. In other words, during that period of time, I pitched nine complete games in 29 days. That's nine times in a row with two days rest. Of course, you can't always do that in the World Series, as the Braves found out against the Cleveland Indians. Johnny Sane pitched a four-hit masterpiece in the first game, outdueling Bob Feller one to nothing. But it was all downhill for the Braves from there. Still, the Spawn and Sane legend lived on. They were friends, roommates, and more than just pitchers, as Sane is quick to point out. Well, I use Warren Spawn for an example. Here's a guy who could hit, he could bunt, he could field his position, he could hold men on base, and he could pitch. Now, how many games did he win? He won 20 games, 13 years. How many games did he win by being able to do the other things? Sane also was quite a hitter, batting 323 in 1946 and 47, and in 205 at-bats, he struck out only once. But Spahn, who won his 300th game in 1961, is one of baseball's greatest pitchers. He holds the National League record with more than 5,200 innings pitched and owns the Major League record for victories by a left-hander with 363. And he didn't win his first game until he was 25. No wonder, after Spahn and Sane, the prayers went out for rain. Now a visit to Montreal's AAA Farm Club, the Indianapolis Indians, where manager Joe Sparks has a relief pitcher with a blazing fastball. Mike Smith's a hard-throwing pitcher. He has a great fastball. Sometime we clock in the 97 range, and he's got a good curveball. And uh, I think down the road he gets everything together. He's going to be an outstanding major league pitcher. And uh, he's a type of guy that could be a Lee Smith reliever in the major league. But for all his potential, this Smith brother is even better known for a gift that puts him right up there with one of the greatest. I've been quoted in uh, news magazines and books and magazines as uh, Yogi Bear would be proud of me. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know where he is right now, but I'm proud of Yogi Bear because as a kid, I always admired Yogi Bear. In this age of short relief and long relief, Smitty is one pitcher whose specialty is comic relief. Mike Smith's been one of my pitchers for, this is the third year, and he's come up with some real dandies, and we call them Smittyisms. We checked out a hotel, and I said, uh, excuse me, I'm in a hurry, I like to pay my accidentals. And I was meant to say, incidentals, so, you know, it started like that. One day, Smitty came uh, limping into the training room, and uh, I said, Smitty, what's the matter? And he said, something's wrong with my leg. I said, what's the matter? He said, I think I got shin sprints. I ordered a salad, and, uh, I asked the waitress, could I get some neutrons on my salad? And they, and they caught on to it. I, I meant to say, you know, croutons, but I said neutrons. 
Smitty's been known to visit a tooth dentist, and his girlfriend has a most unusual job. Mike says uh, she'd be working for a pharmaceutical pharmacy. One time, a teacher asked me, said, Michael, would you come up in front of the classroom and to the board and uh, work out this problem? And I said, no. She said, why? Because, uh, because I'm tired. One of the things I remember about Mike Smith was the time that we were uh, picking uh, cars for the uh, Indy 500. Smitty's getting ready to pick, and uh, he goes, boy, I hope I get uh, uh, Mario Mandretti, or, or at least his uh, son, Michael Mandretti. Mario Mandretti. Mario Mandretti. The car get back faster than the bus will because the bus has bigger wheels. It's an exercise in speech that just might take Smitty to the talk of fame. My manager, Joe Sparks, he just seems to, you know, just love it. And he, he remembers more of my Smittyisms than I do because I say them and I don't mean to say them. And it's not something I sit at home and practice. Smittyisms, destined someday to find a home in the Smithsonian. Hi, I'm Jerry Coleman, former Yankee, a longtime broadcaster. You're watching Classic Sports Network. Big NASCAR fan, eh? So if you can't get to the races, how do you get official merchandise for your favorite driver? Well, here's how. Call this toll-free number and order your official 1997 race pack. Say your favorite driver is Rusty Wallace. Your race pack would include a Rusty Wallace license plate, key ring, and bumper sticker. You also get a NASCAR mug, a NASCAR can cooler, a 1997 Winston Cup schedule, and an official Ford racing cap, the car Rusty drives. Choose from many of today's hottest drivers. Sorry, some drivers may not be available. But if your driver's race pack is not available, order the regular race pack. It has the same great NASCAR items in your choice of Ford, Chevy, or Pontiac racing cap. The special TV price for all this is just $29.95, and it's not available in stores, so call now. To order your 1997 race pack, call 1-800-446-4771, or send check or money order for $29.95 plus $585 shipping and handling to the address on your screen. The 1997 race pack is not available in stores, so call now. 1-800-446-4771. Sorry, no CODs. Number 512, and the Say Hey Kid of the San Francisco Giants now becomes the all time home run leader in the National Classic League. Sports Network, where the legends play. Our stat of the week focuses on Joe Morgan. Yes, that Joe Morgan, the rookie manager of the Boston Red Sox, who, upon taking over the team, displayed a Midas touch. Joe Morgan is 2-0 and oh as Red Sox manager. Boy, Joe, Mo Joe Morgan has things going in the right direction early on in his first three games as manager of the Red Sox. And they go to 4-0 oh under new manager Joe Morgan. And the Red Sox win their fifth in a row since the All-Star break and under Joe Morgan. And the Red Sox make it six in a row under Joe Gordon. Joe Morgan. <laughs> I'll get Morgan and Gordon next. The rookie manager led the Red Sox to victory in the first 12 games he ever managed in the big leagues. He's now 17 and 1. Not bad for a kid. Chansky from the 1969 World Champion Miracle Mets, and you're watching Classic Sports Network. <laughs> 